Can you guys hear me? Hope everyone is doing well today. I'm feeling amazing. Everything's going great. Started my day off well. You know what I did this morning? I played pickleball. Boom. There was like four courts set up. It was me and my friend on the other side of the court, and then a bunch of seniors. <laughs> um, absolutely beautiful. Great game. A lot of fun. Okay, guys, Robin Hood. Holy. A interesting quarter. We'll go through it. There's some goods. There's some bads. Obviously, it's not a stock. Well, I mean, not obviously. It's not a stock that I hold. <laughs> That's so fun. Obviously. Um, they're a uh, pretty cheap company whenever it comes to their market cap. And then whenever you consider that the high majority of their market cap is in uh, cash and cash equivalents, it becomes extremely cheap. You're looking at a two, two and a half billion dollar company total, um, you know, excluding cash just for their whole operations. Let me bring up the, the thing here, and then I'll probably drop off the dark mode. Let me see. Okay. Boom. All right. Awesome. Okay. If it's too bright, you guys let me know and I'll switch it. The only problem is whenever there's a lot of graphics in different colors, it kind of gets a little wonky. Looks a little weird. Whatever. Okay. So let's just go with straight with the highlights. Calls in uh, 19 minutes or so. Had a little extra time. Um, let's just go through. So one thing instantly, quarter over quarter, new amount of cumulative uh, funded accounts. Now, the difference with this, potentially with a SoFi, is that this is funded accounts, not just created accounts. But still, 120,000 accounts quarter over quarter is tiny, okay? Comparatively to something like a SoFi or even other companies that have something like 23 plus million users. I think to Nubank, you know, May 15th. I hope that you guys are all there. That will be the best earnings. You guys think I'm I'm hyped about this episode? Just wait till New Bank comes out. I can't wait to see what they have in store, what the CEO David actually has to say. But we're talking about Vlad Teniev. We're talking about uh, Robinhood. Um, 120K accounts, not that great. Comparatively to last quarter, they added 50,000 accounts, so a little bit better. Comparatively to what they did do back during the uh, COVID times, these, this is peanuts. Okay, um, that being said, it wasn't the worst quarter, and the stock reflects it, by the way. Uh, stock is up 5.5% on the after hours, but that's also because um, people weren't expecting all that much from Robinhood. Hey everyone, good to see a couple of the regulars in the chat. If you guys are watchers of this channel and you guys do not comment, please give me the satisfaction of saying hi because the people that do actually comment and stay in the chat, like that's what builds the community, right? I, I really, really like seeing a lot of the familiar faces. Um, so I appreciate you guys being here. George, Shoeless Joe, Edwin, appreciate you guys all here. Um, Peter, I don't know if I've seen that. Do you comment often? I don't know. Thank you, thank you. That, that satisfies my need. A couple more comments. Thank you. Okay, this was pretty cool, though. This is what all the hype is on, on Twitter right now. The roadmap for new products that are coming out, okay? In, in the center of all of these things, okay, what I'm looking at is 24-hour stock market. So talk about extended hours on trading. 24-hour trading. People are buying and selling stocks, you know, Midnight, at midnight, you know? So this is obviously where it was gonna go. I, I totally thought that this was gonna happen. At the speed at which it's coming is not something that I anticipated, but Robinhood would definitely be the company to do that, okay? They, these, like, Vlad Teniev, I'll give him one thing, and the whole, the whole team at Robinhood. Amazing company, I'm a big believer in that. Like, they make amazing products. They are the innovators. They, like, there would be no such thing as you know, free commission trading. If it wasn't for Robinhood, and and you know, I know SoFi technically has the claim to fame with things like fractional shares and everything like this. But honestly, it was Robinhood that actually made it popular. So um, they are absolutely big innovators, trying to break into the UK as well. Hopefully, even coming to Canada. I mean, if they if they switch to Canada, I would probably use them as well. 
doesn't necessarily mean that I'd buy their stock on their platform. Uh, you know, they'd be going up against the likes here, you know, in, in Canada with like Wealth Simple and these sorts of things, um, which are still, you know, decent offerings. I get 4% in my, uh, you know, cash accounts and able to buy stocks, fractional shares, everything like this. So um, just not the extended hours and all these things that you guys get in America. It's unbelievable. All the, all the different features and stuff makes it super easy for like share lending and everything. You guys don't know how lucky you have it. Um, accounts. This is starting to look like the most boring stock chart or, or bar chart that there exists. You know, next quarter, it's just going to be a straight line across. They better stop showing it because it's going to just be <laughs> just green across the board. Nothing to show here. Uh, they're just not adding accounts. I think people still have this weird taste in their mouth for, from the GameStop and AMC things whenever they stop trading for or froze trading for a little bit. Um, even though there's many companies that did that, TD Bank and a whole bunch of them, but uh, Robinhood was the one that got the brunt of it because they were supposed to be for the people and they kind of took that away. Yada, yada. Okay, monthly active users starting to return. See, whenever there's a brokerage company that specifically focuses in on things like just the stock market, it was kind of known that they were going to have a little bit better of a quarter, not only because they, they tell you their, you know, their operating metrics on a month over month basis, which is great. I, I love that. Um, but that being said, it's just the amount of people that are buying and, and, and selling. You can, you, you can almost just depict it on how the market is doing. If there's more volume in the overall market, you can assume that there's going to be more volume uh, on Robinhood. So I think a lot of people were anticipating uh, a better than expect or, or better than previous quarter. Now, there was a couple other exciting things right now. So far, this doesn't look all that um, great. Assets under custody did actually see uh, quite a large bump, you know, after um, the terrible 2022 that we had, we're starting to see a recovery, people are putting, um, you know, a lot more money with Robinhood and a lot more money in net cash held because they're offering that 4.65%. How great is that? Uh, only five bucks a month for their gold version, right? Keeps a sticky client, people keep their cash there. And then whenever they do go to actually buy a stock, well, your money's already with Robinhood, you might as well trade it with Robinhood. That leads to a uh, average revenue per user. I honestly should switch to the left side. All the good juicy details are on the right. Okay, average revenue per user did actually raise up quite a lot, not seeing record, or, you know, we haven't seen this level uh, ever since, you know, Q2 of 2021. And even in Q2, it was much, much higher, but still, uh, it did beat out. But this is just revenues, guys. This is just revenues. So revenues are a good way to look at, you know, how, how the company is monetizing. But if they, if it took them a large chunk of money to get that revenue, well, then we're still at, you know, base zero. So uh, hopefully we'll jump into the actual adjusted EBITDAs and stuff like this, which this quarter, I'll tell you why that's very um, important to look for on Robinhood. Uh, that being said, guys, I am once again, listening to the music in my ears. I'll let you know when the call starts should be in about 12 minutes or so. Okay. For the total net revenue, uh, broken down into three different categories. Okay. We have net interest revenue or sorry, I guess I should say transaction based revenue, net interest revenue, and then other. Okay. Um, a lot of great things. This is not actually the chart I wanted to show you. Maybe we'll, maybe I'll just jump over to it. There should be a net interest revenue. This is what I wanted to show you. So if you guys can actually see the numbers, I don't know if this is too boring for you. I love, love, love all the numbers. Okay. Um, is this what I wanted to show you? There was a, a really, really great stat here that I saw. I'm not seeing it here. Anyway, it was a good bump on um, securities lending yeah, this is not what I wanted to show you. I think it might have been in transaction based. Whoa, sorry. I'm on the trackpad. Okay, it's really being wonky with me right now. Why can't I why can't I scroll up and down? Well, that's not good. All right, I'll use the bar on the side then for now. Okay. Um Stock-based compensation continues to fall. We're seeing that across the stock market, people just trying to cut back on expenses, yada, 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 no problems there. Net losses. So uh, this was quite interesting. And, and honestly, I may even need, um, sorry, 
I may even need a little bit of help here because I don't quite understand why this is considered a net loss. Last quarter, um, they did announce that they'll be cutting their founder awards or whatever. Vlad Teniev and his partner won't be taking their, you know, 200 plus million dollars each and they're going to save that for the business but yet somehow that gets counted against the business that they didn't take it i don't get that i don't get that maybe someone can be um maybe someone can explain that to me but supposedly they cut that last quarter and it was marked against them okay i'm going to be really upset if i can't scroll that way maybe i need to give my mouse my trackpad a little cleaning or something i don't know it looks perfectly fine doesn't even i don't know okay um adjusted ebitda wow dude that really sucks okay maybe i can use the mouse keys or something either way um Let me see if I can do. Oh, uh, whatever. Okay, adjusted EBITDA, for example, um, saw really, really great returns um, because obviously they're saving on a lot of their expenses aside from this um, founder chargeback, which I don't understand quite how that works. We'll have to read into that. Um, on the other end, they are comparing, if you actually look here, on a very terrible quarter. So I don't think it's fair. I think maybe quarter over quarter, something like this might be a little bit better. But still, even then, it is a great return um, to where the business used to be. Like I said, they continue to cut back on their stock-based compensation. Um, I did want to find, though... I think we also went back here. And then just a little bit of a, a sore spot right here. They have been spending a little bit more cash... But obviously, if it's leading to more growth, it can be worth it. Now, I did want to bring up that transaction revenue because uh, ba, ba, ba. transaction based revenue. Okay, I think it looks better in the whatever. Okay. I don't know if you guys can see this little sliver. They, they just show it off right here. So it says, uh, you know, one, one, two, one, everything like this. This is their other in their transaction-based revenue, um, which forever went from, you know, one million to two million, has now just taken a bump just in this quarter to $9 million worth of transaction-based revenue. Quite exciting. Oh, I got my trackpad back. Thank God. That was going to be terrible. Okay, let me see in the chat what uh, what everyone's saying just before I go on, just because I feel like I haven't looked at the chat in forever. <laughs> oh, hi. I got a flood of highs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I don't have any support in this uh, this stock either, and and so I appreciate you just being here to, to watch this, um, you know, company. What I think is important about Robinhood is, one, they're a massive innovator in the fintech area, a lot of what SoFi has done has been following what Robinhood has done. So seeing a lot of their innovations, seeing what Vlad and, and, and you know, leadership have to say about the industry on their call is super important to me. Um, a lot of my money is tied up in, in fintechs, in um, <clears throat> you know, the payment space, in the e-commerce space. So I just find it super important to see what one of the larger players has to do. If you have 11 or 12 million monthly active users in, in America, you're a large player, okay? And that's, you know, a lot of it is, is retail traders. What are they doing? What are the, the trends that they're seeing? And uh, yeah, yeah, so, okay. Now, I did have a couple other things that I wanted to show, but I'm just forgetting where all the charts are. I forget. Regardless, it um, it was a decent quarter. I think everyone expected it, though. When the market does better, Robinhood will do better. Um, the twenty four hour, the twenty four hour markets, though, I'm super super interested in seeing, uh, you know, what they have to do there. That will be super cool, super super cool. This 
little thing. I mean, Cash App does it, Robinhood does it. I think this is a bad business model. Instant withdrawals, these sorts of things. I think that will go by the wayside very, very soon. I think Fed now will completely change the way that um, these companies take fees for instant withdrawals, instant deposits, everything like this. I think the whole idea of trade plus two, trade plus one, whatever, is all gonna go away. And so you don't wanna have a large business model made up of something that's gonna disappear. So I hope that you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, PayPal makes money this way, Cash App, Venmo, all of these companies make money in this very similar way. Well, they'll say something along the lines of, yeah, no, we'll transfer money to you right now um, for the amount of 1.5% fee. What they're actually doing is they're just sending you money out of their pocket and they're taking it from yours instead of actually making the transfer. They're just almost lending you the money in a way. That's also how you get, you know, two day early paychecks and these sorts of things is they're just giving you the money. They, they didn't receive it from your, um, you know, uh, from your um, employer any earlier than any other bank would. They're just fronting the money because they know it's coming in and then they take it for themselves. So, yeah, it's it's not a great business model is all I'm trying to say. You don't want to rely on uh, starting to build up you know, different products like instant withdrawal and stuff like this, this that, that'll go by the wayside. That's just my opinion. Um, innovations come quick. Okay. Net deposits are, uh, are growing. Very, very cool. Exciting, but also it's just the market. It's just how it shifts. This is very interesting though. Average revenue per user did do a, a you know, quite a large spike. And I wonder what percentage of this is actually made up of options. So, yeah, so options, once again, um, did make up a large majority of their transaction-based revenue. If people are doing options, Robinhood prints money. That's how they make all their money. You know, they, they offer a lot of things like equities and, and crypto and all these things, but it's options that makes all their money. And you know what? They have a really, really good offering. So it's like kind of funny. It's like I wouldn't necessarily recommend people go elsewhere and, and say that Robinhood is charging you too much for options. No, I think every company is making a ton off of options. They just happen to have a lot of um, monthly active users and a great product. So people use it very often. It's well priced. It's well priced. So um, great company, not my favorite stock. Let's see how the, the market's reacting so far. Up five and a half percent. I mean, whenever I was first watching, whenever the, the quarter just came out, it ran up to like, I think it was like, you know, plus eight or sorry, plus 7% and then back down to, you know, exactly where it was minus 1% and fluctuating. Hi, Aaron. Okay. So I'd love to know in the chat who actually holds Robin Hood. Um, cause, oh, this is all my, uh, my, my my charts for for Robin Hood. But um Okay, who actually holds this stock? Cause I don't. I love them and follow them in the industry. Um really, really excited about the call. Vlad's the most boring speaker though, so I'm probably gonna lose all the viewers. But if you guys actually listen to the words that he's saying rather than um you know how boring this guy is, <laughs> you, you can actually learn a lot. Um, they are actually a, uh, a, a client of SoFi's Galileo Technologies, Galileo Financial Technologies, um, which offers them the cash card, the, the Robinhood cash card. So uh, SoFi, a large position for me, is actually a supplier of that card. And then not only that, um, oh, okay, a lot, of, a lot of shareholders. Okay, cool. So I would love to know uh, potentially why you like the company versus other um, fintechs or something along these lines. Or, or are you just bag holding? So are you guys, um, super interested in the stock and, and believe in it going forward? Are you bag holding? Are you, um, buying at these prices? Let me know because that's super interesting. Dgen zoomers use it. I disagree. I disagree. I think they're coming in with a lot of advanced trading options and, um, you know, they're, they're offering 4.65% these sorts of things. I think a lot of people take very kindly to that. And I mean, come on, who honestly has a better user uh, experience or user interface than Robinhood for trading stocks? I know it's like a little gamifying, you know, your, your trading process, but it's extremely quick. 
and super useful. Um, but, 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 let me see what else is in there. That was a fancy way of saying bonus for Vlad. Well, I agree. Their app is, is super great. User-friendly for sure. Customer service. Yes. Best UI. I agree. Yeah. Okay. But there's a, there's a lot of companies that are profitable, you know? Um, great UI, great UI. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, that is undoubtable. I, I, I completely agree. I have a little bit of a separation between, um, you know, does a great product make a great business or, Oh, call is starting. We'll talk after, and I'm going to have a special guest on afterwards as well, potentially, uh, to talk about the earnings as well. You'll need to press star one, one on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. Just while they're just while they're setting this up, I'll also be in the chat. So uh, do a lot of live messaging. I'll go back and forth if anyone has any questions, concerns, whatever. Um, and I'll also, if I hear anything that really, really sticks out, I'll be typing it in the chat. So make sure you have both open. Quarter earnings call. With us today are CEO and co-founder Vlad Tenev and CFO Jason Warnick. Before getting started, I want to remind you that today's call will contain forward-looking statements. Actual results could differ materially from our expectations, and we have no duty to provide updates unless legally required. Potential risk factors that could cause differences, including regulatory developments that we continue to monitor, are described in the press release we issued today, the earnings presentation on our investor relations website at investors.robinhood.com, our Form 10-Q filed this afternoon, and in our other SEC filings. Today's discussion will also include non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations to the GAAP results we consider most comparable can be found in the earnings presentation. With that, let me turn it over to Vlad. Thanks for the intro, Chris, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. We had a strong quarter. I want to call out three things that I'm especially proud of. First, our product velocity continued to accelerate with several innovative products delivered to customers, and we're not slowing down. We're enabling 24-hour individual stock trading for customers by launching 24-hour market next week. Second, we're continuing to see significant growth from the new products we launched last year. And third, in the face of uncertainty in the banking sector, we're continuing to see strong net deposits and improving customer satisfaction. All of this is leading to financial results that keep getting better as we move closer to gap profitability. I'm excited to tell you about all this, so let's start with our business results. In Q1, customer assets under custody were up 26% sequentially to $78 billion, driven by rebounding stock and crypto valuations, as well as continuing net deposits. If we look at net deposits, we saw $1.5 billion in March and $4.4 billion for all of Q1 which translates to a 29% annualized growth rate. And perhaps most importantly, all of the new products and features we've launched in the past year are continuing to drive higher customer satisfaction with Q1 net promoter scores improving more than 20 points from a year ago. Now, if you look at financial results, Q1, we grew total net revenues by 16% from Q4. And by keeping our costs lean, we drove nice operating leverage in our business with adjusted EBITDA up 40% sequentially. I'd also highlight that two new products I mentioned last quarter continue to accelerate, stock lending and instant withdrawals. Each of these had Q1 annualized revenues that grew 30, 50%, 50% above their January levels. If you combine the Q1 revenue from these two products, it's approaching the size of our equity trading business. And that's very exciting and I'm incredibly proud of how well the team is executing. Now, let's turn to our 2023 roadmap. Since we launched over eight years ago, 
Robinhood has introduced several innovations that have become industry standard today. Mobile trading, seamless digital onboarding, zero commissions and no account minimums, and fractional shares. With these innovations, we've disrupted the U.S. brokerage market and grown our business. We're now broadening our offering to include areas like retirement, advisory, and payments, and we're expanding outside the U.S. This is not only good for customers, but it also expands our addressable market. And as you know, we've organized our 2023 roadmap into three areas, deepening relationships with our customers, innovating for our active traders, and launching new growth opportunities. Let me talk about how we're deepening our relationships with our more than 23 million existing customers. Our goal is to serve the entirety of our customers' critical financial needs. We started with trading and investing, and more recently, we've launched spending, saving, and retirement products. We track our progress here by looking at net deposits and ARPU. In Q1, net deposits grew at a 29% annualized growth rate and ARPU increased to $77, the highest level since 2021. Our focus has been on helping customers save and invest their long-term money. In January, we launched Robinhood Retirement, the first IRA with a 1% match, no employer necessary. We've continued to enhance the product. Customers have already invested over half a billion dollars into their IRAs. It's great to see this early customer response, Team's roadmap is full, and we think retirement has a ton of growth potential. We also love what we're seeing in Robinhood Gold. At the end of Q1, Gold subscribers continue to increase up to 1.2 million, and Gold cash sweep balances were up to $8 billion. Our Gold yield is now 4.65%, and we're offering up to 2 million in FDIC insurance starting June 1. We see a big opportunity here to provide differentiated value to customers and we're working hard to get the word out even more, including by launching a new marketing campaign across multiple channels. You may have seen our TV ads during the NBA playoffs. What we've seen from gold in the past six months gives us a lot of confidence to increase our investment, and we're looking forward to unveiling some new gold features in the coming months that provide our gold customers even more differentiated value. Finally, We're going to deepen relationships with our customers even more by taking our first steps in advisory. Our goal is to provide a personalized advisory experience, much like what high net worth individuals have traditionally received from human advisors, but at a much lower price point by using technology. We believe this can help a lot of people who want access to advice, but have been deterred by the traditional 1% annual fee. We're excited to share more with you later this year. Now, let's discuss active traders. Over the past year, our work on options, including advanced charts, cash accounts, and strategy builder, helped drive Q1 option contract volumes up 16% and Q1 active trader NPS up over 30 points year over year. We feel like we're on a good trajectory with options, and we have now turned our focus to our core equities offering. In April, we started rolling out stock screeners a powerful research tool with the simple and beautiful user experience our customers have come to expect from Robinhood. We really love what we've built here, and we're excited to get it into more of our customers' hands. And just ahead of this call, we announced the launch of 24-Hour Market, which will make us the first U.S. retail brokerage to offer 24-5 trading of single-name stocks. This is an exciting upgrade to our stock trading product. It allows our customers to better manage their risk and take advantage of opportunities no matter what time of day they arise. We're starting with over 40 well-known stocks and ETFs and plan to expand from there. And as we look ahead, we're also working to add a broader selection of assets to Robinhood. In March, we applied for a futures commission merchant license. Pending regulatory approval, we hope to launch futures trading around the end of this year. There's so much more to build for our active traders, and we're excited to continue to innovate for them. The third part of our 2023 roadmap is exploring new growth opportunities to broaden the scope and geographical reach of our products so we can add more customers and increase our revenues over time. In Q1, we rolled out our non-custodial Robinhood wallet, which customers have downloaded in over 130 countries around the world. Customers love having total control of their crypto and NFTs, 
as well as the no gas fees for coin swaps on the Polygon chain. There's a lot more to build here, and we're encouraged by the early user feedback. As we brought Robinhood Wallet to market, we found that one of the biggest problems was that the fiat to crypto on-ramp solutions available in market were too cumbersome and expensive to use. So we built our own that we're calling Robinhood Connect, and it leverages the multiple payment rails and robust trading infrastructure we've developed at Robinhood. Two weeks ago at Consensus, our crypto GM, Johan Kerbrot, announced that we're offering Robinhood Connect to third-party developers. We're pleased by the early response we've seen and believe we'll, we're well-positioned to take market share versus early entrance. Finally, we're making progress towards our ambitious goal of launching brokerage operations in the UK by the end of the year. We have an existing license in place, a brand that resonates, and experienced leaders running the effort. So we're excited to launch and start driving innovation in the U.S. market, in the U.K. market, like we've done in the U.S. over the past eight years. We're really excited about the roadmap ahead of us, and there's so much to do. With that, I'll turn the call over to Jason. Thanks, Vlad. It's good to speak with everyone today. In the first quarter, we stayed focused on serving customers, growing our business, and driving long-term shareholder value. Our team continued to execute on our product roadmap, scale products we launched over the past year, and drive adjusted EBITDA higher. As I look back over the past year, I'm incredibly proud of how our team executed to transform the financial profile of our business. While a year ago we had our lowest quarter of adjusted EBITDA, in Q1 we matched our all-time high. We grew revenues for four quarters in a row while getting to a leaner operating model. As a result, our Q1 adjusted EBITDA of $115 million is up over $250 million from a year ago. On an annualized run rate basis, that's an increase of more than $1 billion. And our Q1 adjusted EBITDA margin of 26% was an all-time high. And we aren't stopping here. We are committed to becoming profitable on a gap basis, and we're making good progress on that front. Looking at our Q1 gap results, EPS was negative 57 cents. This included a one-time non-cash charge from our founders who canceled their 2021 equity awards that significantly reduces our SBC quarterly run rate going forward. EPS prior to the 2021 founder award cancellation was negative three cents, so we're getting much closer to gap profitability. Now let's look at our first quarter business results. Customer assets under custody increased 26% sequentially in Q1 to $78 billion as growth stock and crypto valuations rebounded and customers continued to deposit money into Robinhood. Looking at net deposits, they were $4.4 billion in Q1, which translates to a 29% annualized growth rate relative to Q4 AUC. These resilient customer net deposits position us really well for continued asset growth as markets rise over time. Turning to net funded accounts, which represent unique users on our platform, they increased by 120,000 in Q1 to 23.1 million. Additionally, we now have over 250,000 retirement accounts that already have an average balance of over $2,000. The vast majority of these Right, retirement accounts were funded by existing customers who are significantly increasing their average AUC at Robinhood by making these IRA contributions. We're continuing to work on new disclosures to highlight progress like this as we deepen our relationships with customers. As for monthly active users, they were 11.8 million at the end of Q1, up from 11.4 million a quarter ago. Now let's review Q1 revenues. Total net revenues were $441 million, a 16% increase from Q4, as transaction and net interest revenues increased during the quarter. Q1 ARPU was $77, up from $66 last quarter, and the highest level since 2021. Transaction-based revenues were $207 million in Q1, up 11% sequentially. Equity and options volumes picked up from Q4, and crypto volumes were in line with Q4. Moving to net interest revenues, they were $208 million in Q1, up 25% sequentially. The increase was driven by higher securities lending activity, 
cash suite balances, and short-term interest rates versus Q4 levels, partially offset by lower average margin balances. Q1 interest earning assets were 22 billion, up 21%, or 4 billion sequentially, primarily driven by gold customers continuing to bring more deposits to Robinhood. Looking ahead, we anticipate Q2 net interest revenues will be up roughly 15 million from Q1. This outlook assumes the Q1 level of securities lending revenue and today's levels of balances, deposit rates, and Fed fund rates. Of course, our Q2 results could be higher or lower depending on how the quarter plays out. Moving on to other revenues, they were 26 million in Q1, roughly flat from Q4. Gold subscribers increased for the second quarter in a row to 1.2 million, up about 40,000 sequentially. We love that more customers are benefiting from gold, and this is also good news for our revenues. Gold subscribers have ARPU, that is multiples of our average customer, as they bring more assets and use more of our services. This is also true for newer cohorts that joined to take advantage of our high yield offer. This gives us a lot of confidence to keep investing in the gold value proposition. Looking ahead, as you know, Q2 is proxy season, which drives a seasonal increase in other revenue. And our Say Technologies team is managing Robinhood's proxy services this year. Because of this, we continue to expect a sequential increase of around $30 million for other revenues in Q2, with Q3 returning to roughly Q1 levels. I also wanted to note that with April being tax month, it's typical across the brokerage industry to see lower net deposits and trading. For us, it was great to see customers add another 1.4 billion of net deposits in April, in line with our Q1 average. This drove cash suite balances to a new high of 10 billion earlier this week. For MAUs, they declined about 3% in April. And for trading, while options and equities were off 17 and 27% respectively versus the Q1 monthly average, crypto volumes were in line with Q1. We hope this color is helpful ahead of providing our monthly metrics next week. Now let's review Q1 expenses. At a high level, we really like the operating leverage we're generating as we stay disciplined on expenses. One measure we track is annualized revenue per employee. In Q1, it was $760,000, which is more than double from a year ago. It was also great to see Q1 adjusted EBITDA grow 40% from Q4, more than twice as fast as total net revenue growth. Looking more closely at our costs, let's first review OPEX prior to SBC. It was $352 million in Q1, slightly below the lower end of our full year 2023 outlook range. Looking forward, there's no change to our full-year outlook. We continue to expect 2023 OPEX prior to SBC to be in the range of $1.42 to $1.48 billion. And as a reminder, our annual employee merit increases were in March, so you'll see that full effect in Q2. Turning to SBC, it was $598 million in Q1, which included the one-time $485 million non-cash charge from the Founder Award cancellation. This Q1 result was about 30 million better than our previous first quarter outlook. We're flowing this through into our full year 2023 SBC outlook to improve it to 925 million to 1.005 billion. I also wanted to highlight that over the long term, we think it's important to manage share-based compensation as a percentage of revenue to lower levels. In Q1, apart from the Founder Award cancellation, SBC was 26% of total revenues, down significantly from a year ago. And as we look ahead, we're working to lower that percentage more over time. Now turning to capital management. In Q1, our balance sheet remains strong, with about $6 billion of corporate cash and investments. This includes about $500 million that we moved in Q1 from cash into a laddered portfolio of treasuries and other high-quality assets with an average duration of less than a year. As for capital deployment, I wanted to briefly note that we are making some progress on discussions to purchase most or all of the 55 million Robinhood shares that were acquired last summer by Emergent Fidelity Technologies. 
We don't have any specifics to share yet, but we look forward to providing updates when we can. In closing, I'm really pleased with the financial progress we've made over the past year while continuing to deliver new capabilities and enhancing customer experience. Q1 was the fourth consecutive quarter of revenue and adjusted EBITDA growth, and we continue to focus on driving profitable growth over time. With that, Chris, let's move to Q&A. Thank you, Jason. Uh, for the Q&A session, we'll start by answering shareholder questions from Say Technologies. These are ranked by number of votes. We'll pass over any questions that were already answered on the call or in prior quarters. We'll also group together questions that share a common theme. After that, we'll turn to live questions from our analysts. So I'll kick it off with our first question from Say. This one's from Jason. So two questions we're combining here. The first is Suraj P. asks, what is the plan to be a profitable company? And Gregory P. asks, what are the primary ways management plans to return value to shareholders in 2023? Great. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the questions. We're really focused on three things to drive shareholder value. Uh, first, we want to keep launching new products and improve upon our existing products. We've made a lot of momentum here, and our product velocity is fast as, uh, as we've seen it so far as a company, so we feel really good about that. Uh, the second is, is we want to drive profitable growth, and we're going to keep our costs lean and find ways to drive even more efficiency over time. Uh, this quarter, it was nice to see our adjusted EBITDA grow at twice the rate of our revenue growth, uh, and we're working on driving leverage in our business uh, even more over time. Uh, and then lastly, what I'd say is we want to efficiently deploy our capital. Uh, this would include, you know, how we deploy capital for organic growth opportunities, uh, for possible M&A growth, uh, and as well over time could include returning some capital shareholder shareholders. And I think if we do these, th these three things really well over time, uh, it should create a lot of shareholder value. In terms of uh, reaching profitable growth, I don't want to predict uh, any particular timeline on that but we are getting really close. We're you know, excluding the founder award cancellation. Uh, our EPS was minus three cents per share. So we're gonna keep focusing on, on uh, you know, rolling out new products and, and keeping our costs lean and, and we should get there over time. Thanks for the question. All right, thanks Jason. The next question is also from you, for, uh, for you. <laughs> um, Philip S. asks, what does Robinhood's financial position look like after all the recent regional bank failures what does Robinhood do to ensure that it doesn't find itself in the same position as those from SVB, Signature Bank, and First Repu Republic Bank? And a similar question comes from Mashur Amen. Uh, with so many banks going under, what is the Robinhood exposure? Yeah, thanks for these questions. Um, I, first, I think it's really important to clarify that Robinhood is not a bank. You know, we keep our customer cash liquid, um, and we don't have the risk of asset liability mismatch that uh, banks have to manage. Uh, also, it's great to see that our customers continue to deposit funds with us. Gold cash sweep balances were up 67% from last quarter, up to $8 billion. And in March, when all the banking turbulence happened, our customers deposited $1.5 billion with us. Uh, so we think we're in a really good position, and uh, particularly as customers respond to our great offerings for, for gold members. So thanks for the question. All right. Thanks, Jason. The next question is, from, uh, is for Vlad. Um, it's from Edward O, who asks, any plans to add custodial accounts to allow, allow parents to teach their children about investing? Yeah, in short, absolutely. This is part of our longer-term roadmap. And we recently launched retirement, as, as you're probably aware, and we now have hundreds of thousands of customers that have multiple accounts with us. So with retirement, it was really the first time that a customer could open multiple brokerage accounts within our product. And it took a lot of work to, to, to build the infrastructure for that and build the product affordances necessary. Um, so now it's much easier for us to add different account types. And we hear from customers. They want to teach their children about investing. They also uh, are interested in joint accounts and would like to collaborate with their finances and manage them with their partner. So um, these things are definitely part of the longer-term roadmap. We want to make sure we continue deepening relationships with our customers as we've been doing with the launch of retirement. Um, keen to do it. No specific timeline to share, but stay tuned. All right. Thanks, Vlad. The next question is also from Edward O, who asks, 
Um, Robinhood launched IRAs about six months ago. How has adoption been? How does it compare to leadership expectations? And are retirement accounts a key part of Robinhood's strategy going forward? Yeah, uh, we're really pleased with the contributions we've seen so far. Um, over half a billion in assets, leading to $5 million in matches to customers. And we're seeing customers continuing to bring more of their cash um, on, onto the platform. The feedback that we're hearing has been really good as well. Customers love the match. They also love the fact that we're providing recommendations and the recommendations are now being used by two thirds of customers that onboard onto retirement. Um, and, and we're excited about that, especially when we think about what that means for the future of advisory and providing personalized ongoing advice to our customers to help them manage their investments. One thing that I'd add is if you look at total accounts that we added this year between brokerage and retirement, it was about the same number of total accounts that we opened in all of last year. So it's really nice to see this kind of acceleration in new account growth. Great. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, Jason. The next question is for Jason. Um, and uh, Richard S. asks, can Robinhood shareholders have free access to gold? Yeah, thanks for the question, and thanks for letting me answer this one instead of Vlad. Uh, <laughs> we want to make gold the best deal in financial services. Uh, we think it's a great deal at $5 per month, uh, just a, a great value overall. We're going to keep investing in the product to make it even better, and for now, we don't have any plans to give it away for free. All right. Thanks, Jason. The next question is, from, for, is for Vlad, and it's from uh, Sajan P., who asks, um, on the last call, it was mentioned that Robinhood was looking into adding an advisory program to their services. What will this look like, and are there plans to work with a seasoned wealth management company, or will it be kept in-house? Hi, Sajan. Uh, yes, we mentioned it on, on the last call, and we are getting very excited about what we can do in advisory. Um, we've hired some great people, in particular our head of investment strategy, Steph Guild, uh, who's an industry vet with 20 years of experience uh, at large financial institutions. Um, you might have seen sh she's got a weekly column where she talks about the markets. Um, that's quite good. And um, we really think that in Robinhood, we can build the expertise necessary to give our customers uh, amazing advice. And we've got teams hard at work building a great advisory product and we believe that uh, we can deliver that to customers uh, using the teams we have in-house. In so um, more to come, obviously, as the work progresses, but uh, we think we can, we can build something really great for customers here. Awesome. Thanks, Vlad. Vlad, the next question is also for you. Um, GC asks, is Robinhood exploring ways to leverage AI into its services? Yeah, um, I think that over the next few decades, uh, every company will have to transform into an AI company. I mean, look, looking at um, the past 20 years and, and how sort of the, the companies that have been able to move ahead and create differentiated value um, have been technology companies um, in the same way that every company sort of has needed to become a technology company. I think AI will um, sort of be embedded into the fabric of, of all companies. And that's how we're thinking about it. Robinhood has always been early to adopt new technologies like data science and machine learning, um, both to lower our costs and deliver product experiences and value for our customers. And we're really excited to continue to embed AI uh, as a tool both internally and uh, helping us ship products even faster and uh, incorporating into existing products and, and new products. So we, we think that the impact of, of AI and other tools that we've seen thus far is going to be extraordinary. All right. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, the next question is also for you. It's from Justin P. who asks, when will Robinhood support an official trading API for creating trade automation like other brokers? Yeah, this is, this is something we're excited about and we hear from our active traders about, but we, we don't offer it today. Um, if you look at Robinhood Connect, which we uh, announced and started rolling out recently, um, that leverages some of the trading infrastructure on our crypto side for 
uh, a developer and B2B targeted product, making it easier for our active traders and innovating for them is top of mind. So this, this is definitely something we would look to offer over time. Um, so stay tuned. All right. Next question is also for you, Vlad. Uh, Tarun G asks, there's a perception that Robinhood is not as safe as other older brokerage firms like Fidelity and Schwab. Is Robinhood doing anything to change this perception? At Robinhood, safety is our top company value. And when I think about what that means, several things come to mind. First is great customer support. And we made tremendous progress over the past few years uh, adding more channels, improving the quality of customer support, um, overall making it much better, and the progress there continues. Um, the second thing is making sure that our app and our infrastructure is reliable and available to customers um, when they need us the most. And we made tremendous progress there, too. Um, the, the third is the safety of customers' assets within Robinhood. And um, as we announced earlier in the call, um, with Robinhood Gold, we're offering a 4.65% APY on customer uninvested cash. And we're also offering $2 million of FDIC insurance uh, starting June 1st. So your money is going to have higher insurance uh, in Robinhood Gold and in our cash sweep than you would get at a typical bank. Um, I should also mention, as with every, every brokerage account, your brokerage assets are CIPIC insured, and we also have excess CIPIC coverage. So what does this, what does this mean? Um, when we look at kind of how customers are engaging with the service, uh, we're seeing higher NPS, indicative of increasing customer trust, and the results speak for themselves. Customers are continuing to trust us with their deposits. When we see a lot of institutions in the banking sector and, and elsewhere uh, seeing outflows, in this quarter, we're continuing to see strong inflows with 1.4 billion in net deposits and 4.4 billion in, in Q1. So uh, we, we feel really, really good about customers increasingly trusting us. All right, last, last question from Say, um, and this is from uh, for Vlad. It, it's, uh, Jesus A asks, how is Robinhood better or different from other platforms what moves will Robinhood be making to become the top trading platform? Well, in, in my opinion, we are the most innovative trading platform in the marketplace. Uh, we've introduced several new industry innovations that have become norms, um, not just, uh, not just z zero commission, no account minimum trading, but uh, also recently retirement with a 1% one per embedded match um, which we're very excited about. And with the announcement of 24-5 trading, uh, we're leading the industry once again. So we're gonna continue to focus on our customers. We're gonna make progress uh, launching products in a way that emphasizes customer safety, but we're gonna continue to innovate. And I'm very, very excited about the things that we're launching and, and we have launched in the past few months. All right, thank you, Vlad. Thank you, Jason. Um, and that concludes our shareholder questions from Say Technologies. We really do appreciate all our shareholders taking time to ask these questions of Vlad and Jason. And we're looking forward to more next quarter. Now I'll turn the call over to Liz to lead Q&A from our analysts. I really like As that they do the shareholder to questions. Question, please press star 1 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 1 again. In the interest of time, we ask that you limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Our first question comes from a line of Rich Ripetto with Piper Sandler. Yeah, good evening, Vlad. Good evening, Jason. And uh, congrats on the, on the improved profitab uh, profitability in the quarter and great disclosures, too. So uh, my question Thanks, is Rich. on – my question, uh, Vlad and Jason, is on – the net interest income it improved 25% quarter over quarter. And Jason, uh, I know you talked about a $20 million increase, but it, this turned out to be $41 million. And, and I guess I'm trying to see what surprised you. Uh, I can see the fully paid securities lending was a little bit better, but what surprised you to give you that bump up in NII quarter over quarter? 
Yeah, thanks for the thanks for the question, uh, Rich. And we were pleased to see the, the pickup in NII. I mean, there's a few things that I call out. You highlighted, um, you know, securities lending. You'll recall that last quarter uh, was a particularly soft quarter for SEC lending. And uh, at the time of the call, we were cautious in the way that we were uh, evaluating the outlook for Q1. And the activity for SEC lending in Q1 was strong. And um, in addition to the strength of just the activity, which increased the rebates as well as the interest we earn on collateral, uh, we also saw rebate rates uh, tick up meaningfully in the quarter. And so this led to some outperformance. We also saw strength in customer deposits um, and, uh, and also the flow through uh, of interest rate on those incremental deposits beyond kind of what we were anticipating. So overall, really pleased. It was it was higher than we expected, and, and we were pleased with that. Got it. And, and uh, my follow-up will be on sort of the product innovation side, Vlad. And, you know, you talked a lot about advisory and, uh, and hiring a new person. But I would expect when you talk, to, you know, that Robin Hood could, could do it with, you know, technology-driven, uh, I would expect. So any color, is it going to be more of a robo-advisor type uh, platform or, or any insight into what, what the product will look like? Yeah, Say I, I, don't, I don't want to share too much, but what I'll tell you is we want to go beyond just being a robo-advisor, and, and we really want to, use, uh, we want to use technology to give personalized advice at scale, much like what a high net worth individual would would come to expect from a financial advisor that they'd be paying 1% one percent uh, AUM advisory fee for. And, you know, Robinhood can, can build a great experience for that uh, that's mobile first. And, of course, we'll, we'll plan to, to use every technology that, uh, that we think is going to be useful in the market to, to make that happen and deliver it in a scalable way. Thank you, guys. Very helpful. Thanks, Rich. Our next question comes from Dan Dolev with Mizuho. Oh, hi, guys. Uh, excellent results. Excuse me if I missed it, but uh, on, on, you might have provided April trends and, and if yes, can you give us a sense of if, you know what is going on? Is it seasonal or how should we interpret it? And then I have a quick follow-up. Oh, April. Uh, thank you. Yeah, the uh, the connection is a little poor, Dan, but I think we got your question. Uh, yes, so, April. so April, uh, as you know, is tax month, and uh, you know across the industry, you tend to see customer dollars flowing uh, flowing for taxes and less in trading and engagement and deposits. We actually had a really strong uh, April uh, from a deposits perspective, uh, 1.4 billion coming in. Uh, but trading was softer than what we saw in Q1. That's normal. It's expected. We saw it last year. And as we look across industry results, it's pretty much in line with what others are, are seeing as well. Perfect. And a really quick follow-up. Um, Coinbase said that they raised prices for small ticket items on crypto. Have we seen any of that on your platform? Thank you, and great results again. Yeah. Um, We've kept the rebates uh, on our crypto offering the same. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've been pleased by the market share that we have in the retail U.S. crypto offering. We want to make sure that we offer uh, great pricing to customers. And we think that over time, um, keeping the pricing very competitive is going to lead to increased market share gains over time. So it, it's really uh, we want to make sure our, our pricing is awesome and the user experience continues to, to be great for the crypto offering. And we think that it's got a bright future and we see potential to grow our market share there. Great. Excellent stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Our next question comes from the line of Alex Markgraf with KeyBank Capital Markets. Hey, everyone. Thanks for hey, taking the question. Hey, um, just maybe a couple. First on uh, Robinhood Connect, just kind of curious how you see this product scaling, just considering kind of the external nature of the, the product. Um, and then any kind of comments on monetization of Connect would be helpful. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I can, I can field that one. Um, so really, Robinhood Connect is an on-ramp 
for uh, third-party developers to integrate uh, fiat to crypto into their apps. And we see a big opportunity for us in this space because the infrastructure that we've developed for the Robinhood app and the Robinhood wallet to um, not just move money into the platform, but, but also integrate with various trading partners and get great trade execution allows us to offer not just great customer experience to developers, but great pricing. So uh, as, as we look at kind of the space, we see that other on-ramps don't have great funding options. Um, they either offer only card um, or some of them that offer bank linking um, are just prohibitively expensive. And in general, the, the costs are quite high, like north of 5% per transaction. And, and so we see an opportunity to take what we built on the consumer side and really offer a differentiated product uh, product for customers. Um, in terms of monetization, we believe that um, we can offer the product at lower prices and still monetize with the uh, taking a percentage of, of every transaction and earn healthy margins for, for the business over time. That's great. Thank you. And then um, just around 24 or five trading, just kind of curious, any thoughts in terms of what sort of engagement uplift you might kind of expect or anticipate around that? Thank you. Yeah, it, it's uh it's very hard to predict what's going to happen with 24 or 5 trading since this is fundamentally new um, in the market and Robin is going to be the, the first uh, retail broker in the U.S. to offer this for individual names. Um, you know, I, I think that what we'd like to see is um, sort of good liquidity available for, for these symbols um, and liquidity be a little bit smoother and not as much sort of happening on the open and, and the close. Um, and I, I think that would be really, really interesting for the markets. Um, in terms of engagement, uh, we have seen with hyper-extended hours, which we launched uh, last year, that we saw uh, increased volumes. But um, I think it's it's probably a little bit early to to, to give uh, estimates for for what we'd see in terms of volumes there. Makes sense. Thank you. Our next question comes from a line of Devin Ryan with JMP Securities. Great. Hi, Vlad. Hi, Jason. How are you? Hey, Devin. How are you doing? Uh, doing great. Um, start with uh, one for Jason on just the corporate cash. So, you know, obviously the, the firm continues to sit on a lot of cash and liquidity here. Uh, adjusted EBITDA is now you're very solidly positive. So it would seem like you're in an improving position to play offense. And so, uh, you know, appreciate you're looking into repurchasing the shares from emergent technologies as one use, but just love to maybe talk about or get an update on what the other top priorities are. And then on the M&A front, you know, the type of opportunities that you're seeing in the market today. And Jason, if you can, uh, just remind us on those financial hurdles that you need and, and maybe, you know, how that's interplayed with some of the recent deals um, that you've done for context. Yeah, thanks, Devin. Great, great question. So, so first of all, in this market backdrop, um, I do like having a really strong uh, balance sheet. And as you mentioned, you know, $6 billion in cash and investments, uh, given this market backdrop, I think has been a, a, a source of strength for us. So I, I like that. But, you know, it's not an ideal capital structure. And over time, I think, you know, you'll see us continue to work on that uh, to be even more efficient. You know, my mind goes to the M&A uh, front when I think about use of, of, of capital uh, beyond just kind of running our business. Um, and I'd say that the environment's becoming more constructive. Uh, the bid-ask spread has been incredibly wide, uh, you know, as public markets corrected, and I think private markets were a bit slow to face that uh, that reality. And I think it's being uh, more more constructive now, and it's up to us to, to look at opportunities. Uh, you talked about hurdle rates. It's it's looking at things like what's the return on invested capital? Will it be accretive to our business? And then in terms of the, the business itself, is it going to accelerate our roadmap? And, and does the team uh, that we require kind of share the values that we have around a culture around safety and compliance, uh, as well as an obsession for, for customer experience? So these are all the things that we are looking at. And, and like I said, I'd say that the backdrop is in, improving there. 
Okay, great color. Thank you. Um, just to follow up here, I want to dig in a little bit on the futures offering and just get a sense of what the timeline is going to look like to get into that business. And then um, in, in terms of uh, you know, the target audience here, you know, how much demand are you seeing from your existing customers for this product? Um, or, or is this is more about kind of accelerating the push with active traders and, and just you know, kind of sizing the opportunity? You know, could, could this actually be more than 10% of darts over time? You know, we've seen um, what it is for some others, but just love to get a sense of the addressable market for you. Thanks. I'd be happy to, to field that one. We're very excited about launching uh, futures trading to our customers. Um, and as I mentioned in the call, um, the goal is to launch it around the end of this year, pending, of course, uh, regulatory approvals uh, on, on our application. Uh, I think as we think about it, we, we see two uh, opportunities. One is uh, making a really great product for our active traders. As we've talked about a little bit over the past few quarters, active traders have been an increasing area of focus for us. We've been able to drive active trader NPS significantly higher in the past year. Um, we're, we, we love that our active traders are feeling the love and, and seeing improvements in the customer experience for the product. Um, and we think that um, futures trading is an innovative new asset that will allow them to manage their risk in, in new ways. Um, the second thing that we, we think we have an opportunity to do is if you look at what we've done with fractional shares and options trading, um, Robinhood has historically brought new investors to the market who haven't been investing and haven't had access to these products in the past. With futures trading, we see a lot of complexity in the existing products and interfaces, which I think makes them less accessible. So one thing we'd like to do is just uh, – simplify that and make that really, really useful and easy to use in mobile. And we think that there's a lot of white space ahead of us there. And uh, I want to give a special shout out to JB McKenzie, who joined as the GM of our futures business. Um, and uh, I know I know that he's very, very excited to, to launch this as quickly as possible. And uh, maybe this question provides a little bit extra motivation, not that he needs any Exactly. Uh, great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Vlad. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Cypress with Morgan Stanley. Great thanks. Good afternoon, and, and great to see the progress inching towards gap profitability here. Uh, so the question is, how do you think about sustaining gap profitability once you cross there? You've benefited from interest rates having gone higher. So you know, if the Fed were to cut, how do you think that impacting revenues at this point? And which products and revenue pools do you think have the most compelling profitable growth uh, over the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's Jason. I'll start, and we'll see if Vlad wants to add any. Uh, color in terms of you know reaching and ultimately sustaining gap profitability, you know there's a there's a couple of elements that are really important. The first is continuing to improve our user experience on our existing products, expand uh, the service capability of existing products, and then also keep rolling out new products for customers. And we're you know we're seeing a lot of traction here. Our product velocity is uh, only getting faster, and uh, customers are really responding. We're seeing that in our NPS score being up over 20 points uh, overall and up over 30 points for our most active customers. So really, uh, really encouraging signals. Uh, to your point, uh, you know, our revenue is diversifying. Interest income is becoming a larger portion of that. Things like uh, securities lending uh, is also contributing, but also interest on, uh, on cash as well. When we think about the dynamic between, uh, you know, rising rates and falling rates and the effect on uh, revenue, there's a couple things that I'd point out. First, there is a bit of a natural offset uh, between uh, changes in interest rates and uh, demand for equities or, or trading activity. And so while it's not a perfect correlation, they do tend to move in opposite directions, and we think that's you know good for uh, kind of the balance of our business. Um, I'd also say that as we continue to roll out new products, that that's just going to further diversify and really strengthen the revenue profile. Uh, you know, of our business. The last thing we're looking at, and, you know, I mentioned it last quarter, uh, is we are evaluating whether we want to use uh, any kind of hedging uh, for uh, significant rate drops, uh, you know, to manage our sensitivity to interest rates. We've been looking at whether 
uh, you know, option floor strategy, for example, be, could be a way to maintain liquidity, do it at a modest cost, um, you know, and, and not introduce any uh, P&L variability. We haven't made a decision there yet, uh, but it's something that we're continuing to look at. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is just that I think the team's done a fantastic job over the past year diversifying our business so that, you know, we can be sustainable in a high interest rate environment. I think the, before the, the fear that we were getting uh, from analysts in the community was doing great in a low interest rate environment, but what if rates tick up? Uh, how will you do then? And I think we've shown that this is a resilient business. The team moves fast and innovates, and we're really pleased with, with how diversified the business has become. And uh, we see opportunities to, to keep pulling on that and do it even further. Great, thanks. And just a follow-up question on crypto. The regulatory environment in the U.S. continues to tighten around crypto. So just curious your perspectives there on the regulatory landscape. What steps are you taking to protect Robinhood, and what risks, if any, do you see? Yeah, so the, the, the crypto environment, um, you know, has, uh, you know, faced, you know, increasing regulatory scrutiny. Um, you know, the, the things that I'd point out is that, you know, we've been a safety first company uh, for a long time. It's been a core value. In fact, it's our top company value. And, and Vlad's talked about it on, on these calls in the past. What this has meant is that, you know, we've been uh, very deliberate in the way that we uh, expand our coin offering. Uh, we've got a rigorous coin framework, and we're very careful in the way that we uh, evaluate those coins. You know, I'd say if you if you compare Robinhood to perhaps others, um, you know, a, across the industry, uh, we consistently demonstrate that we have uh, respect for the securities regulations of the of the country, and and this has led to us making tough decisions on product selection. We don't offer staking. That's something that's been under uh, under scrutiny as well, and so. You know, we'll continue to operate with that mindset. We want to be on the right side of these decisions. At the same time, we want to innovate for for uh, for customers, and uh, I think additional regulatory clarity would be super helpful on that front. Great, thank you. Thanks. Our next question comes from Will Nance with Goldman Sachs. Good evening. Hey, Will. Um, I wanted to follow up on the earlier question on the securities lending. It, it, it sounds like fully paid adoption was a partial driver there, um, and it sounds like that's you know you're baking in kind of consistent securities lending revenue um, in the in the current quarter. You know, when I look at the fully paid versus margin, you know, fully paid definitely up more than margin sequentially, but even the the base level of margin I think was up 70% sequentially. Um, so I was just wondering if you could maybe talk about um, you know how much of this was sort of environmental to you know, the, the demand and what kind of rates you're able to get on that and how much of this um, you think is, you know, maybe just talk about the sustainability in the current macro environment, particularly in light of some of the reduced engagement levels that we've seen uh, that, that you're kind of referencing in the month of April. Yeah, and I'd say that, uh, thanks for your question, Will. I, you know, I, I'd say that the securities lending business is less uh, beholding to kind of uh, monthly engagement metrics. Uh, it's based more on how many of our customers have opted in, whether or not they're engaging on a monthly, on a monthly basis with us. You know, we've seen um, overall strength in the market for securities lending this quarter. I'd say Q4 was unusually soft. It was one of the softest quarters uh, that I've seen in the years that I've been here. Uh, but there was a strong backdrop uh, in Q1 that continues here into Q2. So demand was higher. Uh, it allowed us, with the backdrop of adding more customers to the fully paid securities program, securities lending program, to, to be able to lend out even more, help our customers, um, you know, optimize their own yield by participating, um, and uh, and the rebates that we saw were particularly strong. You know, so far, uh, you know, in Q2, we continue to see, you know, levels uh, kind of uh, consistent with what we were seeing in Q1. Got it. That's super helpful. And just maybe a kind of detailed modeling question on the options take rate. It seems like that's been coming down a little bit over the past several quarters and uh, took, you know, kind of came in a little bit lower than what we were looking for. Just wondering if you could talk about, you know, drivers of that. It seems like it's been more on the rebate side and less on the uh, the actual volume. 
Yeah, sure. So uh, the take rate is really just an effect of mix. Um, so uh, no change in the pricing structure, but the, the tier that includes uh, SPY uh, contracts has just been increasing as an overall percentage in this market backdrop, and that's uh, shown up in a reduced blended rate. Got it. Appreciate you taking the questions. You bet. Thanks, Will. Our next question comes from Ken Worthington with J.P. Morgan. Hey, Ken. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Good evening, and thanks for taking the question. Um, can you give us an update on the new cash card? What has been the uptake on the new card, and any color on what transaction activity looks like there? Yeah, sure. I mean, the cash card, um, you know, is off to a good start. I'd say it's really early, Ken, and um, you know, the uptake, uh, you know, is a few hundred, a couple hundred thousand uh, customers. Uh, and what we're really working on is continuing to iterate on the value proposition. Uh, we want that card to be kind of top of wallet, and we're not there yet. So the team's hard at work. We're, we're talking to customers. We're evaluating the value proposition. I think longer term, this has potential to be, you know, a meaningful, um, you know, uh, engagement driver for us and, re and, and will help us deepen our relationships. Uh, but we're not there yet, but it's early. Okay. Thank you. And then maybe following up on options, uh, trading there continues to represent the majority of transaction revenue from Robinhood, for Robinhood. We've seen index options uh, trading dominate certain parts of retail, particularly zero-day options. Any color you can give us on what portion either index options are or if zero-day options has been a driver of some of the growth that you've seen. And then maybe just to help size, size options for us, you had 23.1 million accounts, uh, MAUs of 11.8. What portion of your customers are trading options for you, um, you know, in this quarter, or, you know, over the last year? Thanks. Sure, Ken. I'll, I'll start, and we'll see if Vlad adds uh, any colors. Um, so, so first, I'd say hundreds of thousands uh, is the order of magnitude on options traders. So, relatively small portion of our, our customers are engaged in, in options trading uh, every month. In terms of uh, zero-day options, we don't currently offer those. It's something that we do hear uh, from customers that they're interested in. But well, we don't offer cash-settled index options. Um, we don't offer cash-settled index options. We have zero-day, but they're uh, ETF, uh, yeah, uh, ETF options traded on the platform. Thanks, Vlad. Um, and so, you know, in terms of expanding that uh, to cash settled, it's something that we'll, um, you know, we'll evaluate over time. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matthew O'Neill with FT Partners. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to confirm the uh, April, uh, one, one of the April trends, I believe it was mentioned that the MAUs were uh, were down after it was uh, nice to see them uh, increase and sort of bucked the trend this past quarter. Um, anything to, to sort of uh, take, take into account there? I know there's a lot of discussions already on, on some of the April dynamics with tax season and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, yeah, it, we, we saw MAUs uh, go from 11.8 to 11.4 in in April, and really, what I had pointed, it's in the zone of, um, it's in the zone of where we were. Uh, sorry, 11.5. Um, uh, it's in the zone of where we were in, in Q1. It's nice to see that it's kind of stabilized, and I just point to the seasonal dynamics of of April that I had referred to earlier in my comments. Understood. Thanks so much. Our next question comes from Mark McLaughlin with Bank of America. Hey guys, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I had, for the first one, I was curious, what was the decision by, behind the uh, reallocation of, I assume, cash to held to maturity securities? Because I know you guys had mentioned earlier you're not taking on a lot of duration risk, so I just kind of wanted to know the accounting reason behind that. Yeah, it's more, um, thanks for the question. So first of all, in the broader context, we've got $6 billion of cash on our balance sheet, and it just uh, was good hygiene for us to take a small portion of that. 
uh, and extend the duration a, a, a bit. So it's held to maturity. It's uh, it's a laddered portfolio that's rolling. Uh, so it's highly liquid, and um, and and that's that was the logic behind it. Uh, just looking at the fair value, it's uh, it's it's right on kind of what the uh, the purchase price was of the portfolio. Awesome, thank you. And then for a quick follow up, um, I, I know in quarters past you guys had kind of talked about expansion, especially starting kind of in the UK. Uh, not obviously trying to uh, monetize client cash balances with a bank charter helps when moving abroad, uh, makes things a lot less complicated. Any updates on international expansion or kind of how are you guys thinking about that going forward? Yeah. Um we're we're making progress towards uh, the goal of launching brokerage in the UK by the end of the year. Uh, as as I've mentioned in the past, we've got an existing license in place. Um, we think that our brand is very strong and will resonate very well in the UK and uh, experienced leaders running the effort. Um, so uh, stay tuned, but uh, we're excited to make it happen. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That concludes today's question and answer session. I'd like to turn the call back to Vlad Tenev for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you guys so much for uh, for listening and asking questions. Uh, we're very excited by the progress. And uh, check out 24-Hour Market. Very excited for that to be uh, launching next week. Me too, Vlad. <clears throat> okay. So, guys, a little recap of what we saw. Very interesting things. Um, one, I just want to re reaffirm that I am a big believer that like a lot, a lot of the benefits that, that we as retail users have, have, <clears throat> you know, been able to use in these markets are due to Robinhood. Okay. I'm a massive believer that they are the best innovator in this space. 24 hour markets. Are you kidding me? Like, you know, people on Twitter already are, are like talking a little bit of, trash about it saying how this is not good for the user, but truly it is, okay? It, it'll be amazing to be able to trade stocks based on whenever news comes out rather than whenever markets are available. I totally think that that's, that should be the, uh, you know, the way forward. And who else but Robinhood would have done that, right? And then we, we knew that it was going to come eventually. I don't think many people could have assumed that it would come this early, but good for them. Um, so, one person in the chat, I think it was Robert, um, was asking about how can Robinhood offer 4.65% in their gold? Because obviously $5 a month does not pay for that um, you know, high interest rate if someone has $2 million in their account. So let's first talk about that. Um, one, I just wanted to show this chart. I saw it lurking here somewhere. Where is it? Uh, if I can't find it, I'll just tell you what it said. But it's pretty much the idea that the deposits, the average uh, person has about $10,000 in their um, account, which they're paying out high interest rates to. Uh, there we go. Cash deposits as of the end of March. Um, ba, ba, ba. Or, you know what? That might be... No, never mind. No, I read that wrong. Okay, regardless. Um, so the idea being that uh, there, there's a lot of things in play here. Okay, so the, the reason how they're able to do this is something called renting a charter. Okay, so it, it's how all these companies that don't have bank charters are able to offer um, accounts where they're able to take your money. You see it all over the place. Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, all of these companies are, are doing what's considered renting a charter, which means they have great relationships with large banks where they go, okay, hey, I will sign exclusively with you to give um, you know, my deposits to you. And it doesn't have to be a single bank. It could be multiple. And in return, I want all of the profits that you're going to make on these deposits. I, I, I want to break even. Obviously, they can't break even because the bank will take some fees. But for the most part, they can get a large chunk of that deposit back because those banks will say, 
Shoeless Joe said, like Apple, exactly, right? So Goldman Sachs is fronting that bill. Um, we don't know how much Goldman Sachs is paying to Apple to bring in those deposits. We don't know how much um, Apple is covering on their own, own end, right? Um, we'll never know this about very, very many companies unless someone slips up on an earnings call and say, hey, you know, we're paying this company a blank percentage, whatever. I haven't seen it yet. Regardless, um, whenever this happens, there's so many different things that play a factor. One would also be, um, bu, bu, bu. where is it? Average revenue per user. Okay. So what they did say on the call is that average revenue per user for a gold member is much higher. See, if you're already storing all your cash there, you have a, then potentially maybe you want to spend that cash because you don't just want uh, all your money to be tied up in a savings account. So then you also get the cash card. Okay, well then that adds another layer of revenue. And then obviously if you're gonna buy and sell your stocks or whatever, well, might as well do that on Robinhood as well, right? Because your money's already there. So it's so much easier to transfer your money from a Robinhood cash account to a Robinhood uh, trading account rather than Robinhood cash account to a SoFi trading account or something along these lines. So it'll always be most beneficial to have those deposits because then it, it, it equals uh, a faster, you know, rail to go trade and, and do all these things, spend, save, invest, whatever. So that also does pay for the percentage is knowing that the people that you're offering it to will increase their revenue with you. Um, then they also do offer the $5 a month. So it's $60 back per year. That doesn't, you know, uh, play a huge part back, but it does offset some of the cost. Um, if they have over a million people, uh, paying this fee, obviously that that's an added benefit to their bottom line or, or top line. Sorry. And then, like I said, renting the charter is the high, high majority where the banks that they are working with. The only reason why they're offering it to that bank and not uh, JP Morgan or something like this is that they're saying, Hey, I want a larger percentage of these deposits back and then you can still keep a fee. So those, those banks will be the sponsoring bank for them. They're not actually going to go lend that money out as, as high of margins, but they'd still rather a fee rather than nothing. So renting a charter is something that is a little bit frowned upon, but Robinhood isn't, <laughs> Robinhood isn't uh, shy of doing things that uh, regulators are uh, frowned upon, you know, <laughs> payment for order flow. <laughs> um, no, but, uh, and I am actually a big fan of payment for order flow. I think it's uh, great for the retail investors. Most times you're saving money on payment for order flow. I, I'm like 95% of the time, <laughs> you know, unless you're, you're trading in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, yeah, maybe you're losing out on the $10 buy and $10 sell. But if you're having ha hundreds of thousands of dollars, I hope you're not even using Robinhood. You're using something like interactive brokers or something. You'll save more money. That being said, okay. I hope that cleared up the, uh, that question. I wanted to speak on this 24 hour markets product. I think that this product will be massive. Okay. And, and the idea was, is that whenever after hours trading came out, there was this big ordeal that, um, active traders, people who were buying and selling stocks and looking out for, for investors all the time, or sorry, not looking out for, but like looking out for their investments and, and constantly trading. What they would do is that they would have their initial brokerage that they would buy from, uh, at least in my time, you know, 9am to, to 4pm or 930, whatever. On the other side, then they would keep a little bit of money at Robinhood or, or any of these other after hours trading platforms, just in the off chance that they needed to buy something during those times, they would use that platform. Okay. So, but in the overall grand scheme of things versus the, you know, all the hours that you can trade on, on public markets versus the after hours trading, that was a small percentage of your time. Now with 24 hour markets, you're going to have to put some money with Robinhood because on the off chance that Elon Musk says something crazy, <laughs> you know, off hours, midnight, maybe, you know, that you're able to trade, buy and sell stocks of uh, 40 positions right now, but that will quickly grow. Okay. Uh, as, as you know, new stocks become high trading, high trading volumes and, and allow them to have high liquidity on these positions, then they'll be able to comfortably release them, um, knowing that they can actually, you know, support those positions. So I think that's an unbelievable product right? I think that's so, so, um, exciting because obviously people will have to have to deal with Robinhood in some form of another. If you start to increase, 
you know, your, your percentage of, of how much you're dealing in Robinhood, maybe you even buy and sell there during on hours as well, because well, that's where the majority of your money is going. And I just think, yes, Fidelity will catch up. Yes, SoFi will catch up. Yes, a lot of these online brokerages will catch up. But Robinhood continues to innovate and be the front runner. Now, there was a comment earlier ago, and this is also why um, I'm not a super big believer in Robinhood. Okay, I love them as a product. I love them as an innovator. I love them, for, you know, me being a, a customer, an investor, is that it's, there's nothing that creates a, a moat. It's re replica, re I can't say that word, replicable. <laughs> you know, um, someone even said in the chat that Fidelity is putting out this very seamless UI that looks identical to Robinhood. And how good does that look for Robinhood knowing that they're being copied 100%? Okay, but Robinhood gets no fees from that. Yeah, sure, they win the argument. Yeah, we made it first, but whose dollars are going to what company, right? So. It's great for the consumer that yes, we get this UI, but it is so copyable and Robinhood can't do anything about it. It's the same reason why I'm not that big of a fan of, uh, oh, sorry, just adjusting the, the focus. Same reason why I'm not a big fan of Snapchat. I think they were maybe the largest innovators in uh, social media companies with stories, with uh, you know, vanishable messages, with all of these different features that they put out, maps and and you know, connecting with your friends via via the uh, geolocations, all of it copied, all of it, okay. And and so you have to be the guys that are continuously large innovators, high R and D spend. It it makes it really really hard to stay on the ball, especially whenever you can't create a moat. After hours trading, um, payment for order flow, free commission trading, whatever it is, in, in one form or another, companies will copy it. And um, even in the things that they are toting, like uh, fully paid securities lending or instant withdrawals, like I said, instant withdrawals, I believe that this is a product that won't exist probably uh, two, three years from now. It just won't. So you can tote your large... Um, you know, your, your, your large gains in that product, but the revenue from that product will become standardized in zero. That's just my belief. Um, yeah, it is a great product, not my favorite stock. Um, and I'm not trying to say that. So then people that have positions in it, uh, you know, you're not going to make any money or whatever. I don't like, like you could, you can make a lot of money. It's up 2% in after hours. That's, you know, that's great. I'm just trying to buy companies that last much longer than this. So then you don't have to worry about macro, uh, like small macro trends. Like for example, whenever they're talking about, um, hedging because they're in such a risk of interest rate changes, it's crazy. They have all of these customers. Um, oh, sorry. I just got a comment that I think is important. Why did they give up on the bank license? I don't follow Robin Hood enough to know that they were pursuing one. Um, if they were, great. But the truth is, is the cost for a uh, bank charter and the regulation behind it is insane. It, it's why SoFi is toted so strong, or why I push it so strongly is because the companies that are able to do it, it's extremely, extremely hard. I mean... Okay, Robert, what are you saying? Are you listening so far? It can be copied. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they will, though. That's the thing. Like, all the products that SoFi has been putting out are Robinhood products. <laughs> like, like truly, After Hours, um, Margin, Options, they're all products that Robinhood has made before. Is, is, you know, Robinhood benefiting from it? So now they're trying to push these B2B products saying, oh my gosh, you know what? We can actually push this out for you and we'll take a margin. And companies right now are going, I don't think we need you, right? So it could be potentially easier for them to offer that and just go, okay, here's our playbook all in one thing. Give us a cut, right? But even then, that's going to, I don't believe that that's a great strategy. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great strategy for SoFi because they have um, large moats behind them that, that, are, that are very, very sticky like a bank charter. So you, you can give it out to a Chime and, a, and Robinhood and, and give them all the technology that you guys have here at, or at, at SoFi, but you'll never get the fees that we get. You'll never get the, the interbank rates that, that, that we get. So um, yeah, that, that's sort of the competitive advantage. 
uh, Robinhood can continue to push out um, more and more features for their for their gold members, but you're still only getting five dollars a month. That that's going to get costly. What I did like was their advisory services. I'm a financial uh, security advisor as my full time job. Like just that, that, that's what I do uh, full time. I I take a one percent cut on all my services, no matter what your AUM with me is. Um, that's just the way the business works. That's the way everyone in North America does it. I don't know past, you know, America and Canada or US and Canada and stuff like this. If they can offer some sort of solution, I believe it'll probably be with AI. They're not saying that buzzword. Um, but if they can offer that personalized solution, knowing what you have, what you're looking for and not offer such a high rate, that could be an amazing product, right? So, um, once again, innovators, not a big uh, fan of the actual company. If anyone um, knows anybody, this is also a thing I also kind of need your guys' help for. I don't know any creators online that are uh, Robin Hood bulls. I want to talk to these people that are, um, you know, they have large bull cases for the company that, that we can talk with. Because I wanted to really have another person on this call, and I was going to have someone um, join, but they weren't actually, uh, they were more just in the fintech space rather than on the Robinhood side. Um, and I'm a little bit bearish on this company, not because they don't have a, a solid position. I just think, I think very uh, long term, I, I, I don't want to make a trade. I want to make a, a, a large position in a company that I think will be a 20 year company, not a two year company, or I'm, I'm sure they'll last longer than two years, but, um, yeah, I, I just, I don't see any moat. Where's the moat? Where's the irre irreplicable business model that I don't see. Um, some fintechs seem to be angling, uh, to merge social with banking. Do you think that there's a decent use case for this? Honestly, I've been super anti that. <laughs> I don't care at all. You know what I mean? This is not Tinder. You're not connecting with people based on, you know, what position you hold. There's um, We're doing it already through YouTube. What do, why do you need public.com or SoFi or any of these things? It makes no sense. It brings no revenue. Um, and in fact, I you, I mean, for, for the fans of the channel, I mean, I, I talk about the positions that I, I hold, but I don't talk about m the size of my portfolio and these sorts of things because I, I like to have a private life and I've got friends and family and all these sorts of things that watch the channel as well. So I wouldn't want to disclose my entire portfolio. So why would I post it all over social media? It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm I like, it was one of the largest complaints about uh, blockchain and stuff like this is like, you, you wouldn't want your, you know, bank accounts being public. Well, what? I think the same thing. It's like, why? I, I don't get it. I never understood that. I don't see where the revenue comes from. Um, doesn't make any sense to me. That's just me. If there's, if there's counter arguments, I'd love them. Haven't heard them. Um, SoFi Weekly this week, guys, I don't know if any of you guys watched it. Um, I know obviously some of you guys do, but because <laughs> I see the names in the chat. I think this week will be a lot of fun. We got a lot of special guests. It's going to be really exciting. Um, and the 10 Q actually just came out during this Robin hood call. I don't know why I'm still here. I don't, you guys should look at my face. Okay. Uh, the 10 Q actually just came out. So I'm going to be breaking that down. Obviously I usually make a 10 Q video. Maybe I can get a little bit of a response from you guys. Should I do, um, a breakdown? See, I, I think I pigeon held myself with, I've been putting out such high not such high quality videos. Come on. I mean, but higher quality videos, like where I, I hire out an editor, I hire out a thumbnail guy, and I try to increase the, the production of these videos. Um, but then it doesn't allow me to talk about, uh, things like the SoFi 10Q. It just wouldn't fit in that model of video. Right. So I, I kind of want to go back to the old school thing or I don't know, make a sub channel or something where I just dump my thoughts into it. Like, like I am doing with these lives. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the night is breaking down this 10 Q. And, uh, by the way, guys, if you ever have any questions or whatever, um, I try to be very open on Twitter and stuff like this. So if you want to follow me, DM me, if you have any questions, one thing I'm not going to do, 
Okay, so I, I'm sorry about this. Uh, if, if you want to talk about a large company, like, hey, what's your opinion on Google? I'll, I'll give that to you. If you want to give me your, or, or ask me about a, an opinion of a company that's not even a billion dollar market cap, I am not going to follow that company. Like, like I don't follow any companies other than maybe Marketa and I barely know about it, uh, under a billion dollars. So uh, I know that people, some people have positions and they want to know that their positions are, are okay and get a, an opinion, but um, I just don't have that kind of time. Um, bu -bu -bu. Okay. Tanner Hood previously had $1.5 million insurance on the cash count. Now going to $2 million. Do you think that they're increasing to match SoFi? Sure. Sure. Um, they can't get it as cheap as we can, though, because one of the... One of the 250,000 FDIC insured banks is SoFi. So that's, you know, we get to keep the deposits. We get to make the money on the actual insur or, uh, um, the actual lending products and these sorts of things. They can't do that. Um, so we will always have an advantage. If, if we had the same amount of users, same amount of everything, I would prefer to invest in SoFi, right? Um... Or do you think SoFi Galileo will be providing the same network it's set up for its own members? No, I, I don't think it's that hard of a, a, like, I don't think that's a product that only SoFi can have. I mean, they just made a, a good connection with seven other banks and set up a system. They did it in a week. <laughs> if, if SoFi created that in a single week, that's, you know, that can be copied. Uh, totally agree. Tanner, the social aspect of SoFi Invest is garbage and kind of childish. If you ask me, I agree. I, I don't use it at all. Or I, I mean, I don't use SoFi, but I would never use it. Like, I don't know if there's a, in the settings to be able to turn it off, but, um, I wouldn't heartbeat. 10 K 10 Q videos sound good to me. Thanks Tanner for your insight and the time and effort you make on our behalf. Wow. Thanks Gary. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Robert, I don't even, uh, <laughs> sorry, dude. I like, it's, it's not that I like, I don't, um, like, I know that uh, everyone wants more opinions, whether it's uh, bearish or bullish on all their positions, just so then they can make, you know, smart decisions on it. But like, I am trying to like, okay, one, I love this YouTube thing. I, I want to continue to do this. I want to build a, you know, um, the scope of how much of my time is spent here on YouTube. And, and by that, I'm trying to do it in very honest ways, like create value for the viewer. I think that that's the only real way uh, to actually make it on any of these platforms is like, I'm just trying to do deep, deep dives for you or really entertaining videos. So that's where I tried to go, um, with the higher content videos, but also with that, more of my time is being taken up by YouTube to the point where like, I'm, I'm diving deeper into video or I'm diving deeper into stocks. I'm diving into, uh, not just SoFi anymore. I'm diving into the, the, the FinTech genre. So then we can look at the competitors because it's such a large part of investing in a company is knowing what their competitors are doing. All that takes so much more time. I'm trying to make this future charts thing, um, and code it with AI and everything like this. So that's been taking up a lot of my time lately. Um, and, and all of it is just to create more and more value. So I hope that you guys appreciate that. And because that's, that's pretty much what everyone at, you know, the SoFi Weekly is doing and any, any, uh, content creator, whatever that term means, is just create value. And in return, if you guys watch or, or use these things that, that YouTube pays for it, it's, it's not enough to replace my job yet with 8,000 some odd subscribers, but it's probably more than you guys think it, it, it does actually make money. Um, but, uh, but with that, you know, I, I just don't have time. I, I want to focus on the things that like, you know, adds the largest value to the base, uh, of, of the users, which right now is SoFi and is growing out into other FinTech positions. Like I'm like, I, I know that now I'm actually starting to have people focus on new bank. And I think that's so cool. If you guys aren't understanding that, like 
I am fall like I know you don't fall in love with positions. I'm falling in love with New Bank right now. This company is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, I am uh, I'm optimistic about May 15th. The thing is though, the thing is is that whenever a company is uh, this incredible, maybe, you know, one of the best companies on the stock market, um the premiums that you're going to pay for this growth is also there as well. So it, it doesn't mean that it's the best investment. That's not what I'm trying to say. The best business? Maybe. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just uh, I hope that all of you guys can make it on May 15th. I'll be doing a live stream. I'm trying to get a guest on. Um, I might even be getting, um, I'm going to ask... Uh, Fede Sandler, who was the head of uh, investor relations for Nubank during their IPO. If you guys didn't see that video on, um, you know, my LATAM, you know, financial boom thing where I did an interview with him, this guy is very, very smart. Smart dude. He built the F1 for the company that actually, you know, that helped IPO the IPO the business. He he did all the interviews with all the largest investors at Nubank. And, um, and yeah, I, I had the pleasure of, of speaking with him and, um, hopefully he'll even join us on the live. I haven't even asked him yet, so we don't know, but he, he's, he's pretty open to doing these things. So I'd be interested in if, uh, if he could take the time out. Then again, he lives in Argentina. So, uh, you know, and he's flying all over the place. Uh, so, you know, I've asked him to come on the call a couple times during like the Melee live stream. And he was in the middle of like, he was flying to, uh, Omaha to go to the, Berkshire Hathaway meeting. So busy guy. Um, I'm hopping on the new bank train whenever I get a bit of capital. <laughs> like I said, I'm not telling you to buy it. What I would tell you to do is just look at the company. Just look at it. Find me a metric that's going down. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's incredible. Some of the highest MPS scores in the entire world. Not, not even just Latin America. In the entire world, it's one of the most liked products ever in history. That's a crazy statistic. Okay, guys. Um, I think you need a mix of videos, short-form videos to hook a new viewer, short-term attention spans, long-form to offer value. I just don't have the... Dude, if I made what I was making at my current job, I would go full-time for you guys and, 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 you know, do 12 to 14-hour days just trying to pump out content with high value information. Just my time. I've got like four hours to do this. Um, ba -ba -ba. Uh, I get a 10 or no worries. You're my favorite YouTuber. Wow. Um, I understand your time is limited. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate that, Robert. Uh, that's a really, really nice comment. Um, I appreciate you being in these live streams all the time. I'll have to find out what, what stocks to do next. Um, but definitely new bank is going to be on that list. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it. Thank you so much everyone for, uh, coming, but I'll log off and, um, who knows when I'm going to do the next live stream. I have a pretty short term on, uh, when I'm going to do the next one. So the fact that you guys keep showing up is incredible. Love all of you. Talk to you guys.